So hi, welcome to the Good Noise Podcast. I'm Shane. I'm Glory. And we're here with... Keith from We Are Scientists. And we're going to ask him some questions today about their new album, Huffy. So congrats on that, by the way. How do you feel about the response to it so far? I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good. People seem to be enthusing over it. I mean, I, I, I try to uh, not engage in response too much. My, I, my mind gets warped whether response is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my inclination <laughs> is to remain as ignorant as possible. That's uh, right. But it, it would also be negligent of me not to try to get some estimation of how people were feeling. So, so it, does, it does trickle in. It seems like people are, are fairly enthusiastic, which is nice. That's good. That's the good. album was very good. So Yeah, I listened to thank it you. earlier. Thank it you. was banging. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, so is there any meaning behind the album name or a cover art? Um, I mean, the, the album name, we, we, we always sort of try to go for album titles that are more uh, like evocative than they are literally associated with the music. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like, you know, th this album is a little more um, like rock base, I guess, than, than the past few albums we've made, which have skewed a little more pop, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's a little more like guitars and pounding drums and, you know, sort of a little, uh, a little scrappier, I yeah. guess, than, than our past few albums. And so I think we were, we were trying to think of an album title that would communicate uh, that essence without being too stupidly rock related and also we are not we're you know as far as rock bands go we're pretty uh timid and or i guess timid is the wrong word but uh you know we're not we're not very bombastic i guess mm -hmm. um and so we were trying to think of of a word that would communicate you know sort of the bombast of rock music but also uh our our inclination to not lean into those rock tropes so we thought you know we're 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 not really a rock band. We're just sort of like more of like kind of we're a little bit huffy sometimes. We're mm -hmm. not as aggro as rock would suggest. We're we're huffy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We also liked the association with the uh, dirt bikes. Huffy yeah, that's as so. well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Like it's not a, it's not a motorcycle, which mm -hmm. you know again would be a big rock trope. It's like mm -hmm. a. It's a children's, a children's <laughs> dirt bike. <I> <laughs> that, that's sort of more our speed, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, um, and the cover art, is I mean by that? Oh, the cover art. Um, so, sort of similarly, we like we like more abstract artwork for the most part. Um, and I, I think I think the idea. So so our, the artwork for this album is. Um, essentially like a, a nice bathroom wall that we have invited people to essentially graffiti on. We've provided some stickers, all, all of like the legible artwork comes in sticker form. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that came up because we sort of wanted a, a you know, an extra reward for people who bought, the physical product, like, it, it, you know, th these days for you to, for you to buy physical music is a laudable move. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we, we, we kind of want to give people a, you know, a reason to feel extra good for having done that. We thought, you know, including a sticker pack and sort of a design your own artwork vibe could be cool and fun. Um, so that, that was how that conversation started, I think. And then it sort of, snowballed okay. from there um that's really cool you had said that like your nice. your previous albums lean more into like the pop side of rock and then this album leans more into the rock side of rock uh wh why was that was it the the quarantine angst was this a quarantine album um um it, it wasn't really a quarantine album we had we had all of this yeah we had all the songs that are going to be on this record written before quarantine we had just started re recording the album immediately before quarantine happened um but i i think part of it is that we this is the first album we've self-produced mm -hmm. and 
I think part of why we wanted to self-produce it was we've, we've tended to feel like when other people produce us, uh, they, uh, the music becomes manicured, I think in a way that we like a lot, but I think uh, maybe subtracts from the, the idiosyncratic voice of the band. Like, I think the things that get um, sort of sanded, the edges that get sanded off uh, tend to be the things that we think are the weird parts of We Are Scientists. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, maybe other people are correct to, to iron those wrinkles out. <laughs> uh, but we, we, we kind of are like, well, you know, we, we are, as, as, you know, as we've made more and more albums and we've gotten more uh, involved in at least, you know, the production of the demos and stuff like that, we started to feel like the things that we like about the demos are the weird, stupid things that we put in that nobody else would. And in fact, often producers like, that's too stupid. I'm taking that out. <laughs> um, so we kind of, we kind of wanted to see what it, what if, if we, uh, you know, tried to be mindful of why a producer would want to sand those edges, but also tried to leave as many of those things in without it being to the detriment of the music. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, so that was our idea behind uh, self-producing. I think what that led to was us sort of trying to lean away from it feeling too much like we were uh, two guys at a computer, okay. mm-hmm. which was our bit, which was our big concern mm-hmm. when we decided to self-produce. So as a long answer to your question, I think that that may be why um, the songs we chose kind of lean more toward live rock vibes. And there's a lot of like computer production stuff in it, but I think because we were trying to avoid finishing an album and having people like, oh, they self-produced and it sounds like they did it in their bedrooms. <laughs> I think we, po- we pointedly like tried to use as much live guitar bass drums from the studio recordings that we did Mm -hmm. before we then took them into our home offices and like chopped them up and went crazy on them. So I think, I think that's why this album leans more uh, in that vein than, Mm -hmm. uh, than our other albums. All right. Uh, So can you tell us a little about your writing process for this album? Yeah. I mean, uh, we, you know, we, as we make, more albums i think we um are are trying to be more open to um uh, songs other than music that we think ought to be on a we are scientists album which in the past like on our first few albums we would you know when we would begin writing a song just like at home our immediate response would be like, well, is this something that we are scientists would put on a record? And if we didn't think it would be often, we would just sort of forget about it because we are scientists is the main thing we think about when we think about writing music. Mm-hmm. Um, but w- that would, that would end up meaning that we would write, you know, maybe 14 songs for an album and we'd cut, you know, the worst three and then we'd have, you know, those 10 or 11 songs for an album. And it was, a super stressful way of going about making a record because mm-hmm. all you were thinking about was like, okay, when will I have enough songs for this record? And I think it would mean that we would focus on the really good songs for that record, but it was, I think it was a little less fun of a way to approach making, making the albums just because yeah. every song, every song was a song that we were like, okay, this song needs to be great. If it's worth our time, mm-hmm working on um and so we've gradually gotten more into the practice of just writing as much music as possible and you know you're always thinking about whether or not a song is good enough to be on an album but these days our idea is like i would like to have a hundred songs to choose from that way when and that way when i'm writing you know song number 76 Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because it's fun, not because I think song number 76 might be on the record. Okay. Uh, okay. And, yeah. then, and, and, then, and then then the game 
sort of becomes like, well, it's been a year and a half since we put out a record. We need to make another record now. Let's look at these hundred songs we have and see which ones a are like awesome songs we'd love to be playing live for the rest of our career. B what songs might be good, you know, to be on British radio or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then kind of see what songs do we think would be interesting and weird and like a cool song that like, you know, we have enough songs on records now that we're, we're not going to play every song we put out live and not every song needs to go on the radio. So what's a cool song to just be on a record that we think is interesting and like worth being on a record, but um, we don't need to worry about being a, you know, linchpin of the set or anything like that. Um, So I think that is our song process now is just kind of like having, having more fun on the day to day writing and then worrying about the albums when it's time to make the album. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's valid. Uh, so how did the track list for this album come about? Did you write the opener to be an opener, closer to be a closer, just kind of shuffle it, listen through a couple times and say, that's it? Or like, what, what was your process for that? Yeah, I mean, it's always it's always a little bit. I would say it's always a bit of a fight, but it's not really a fight. Hmm. Uh, it, it always ends up feeling slightly more arbitrary than than I think I'd like my answer to be. I Mm -hmm. definitely always knew that I wanted the first song, You Lost Your Shit, to be the first song. Yeah. Um, But sort of after that, it's, you know, I'll make a track list. Chris will make a track list. Our drummer, Keith, will make a track list. Our management will make a track list. Um, And they all seem pretty valid. Like when I listen to all of those, I'm like, yeah, I understand why you did that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, you know, I don't necessarily feel comfortable saying, no, my, my track listing is objectively the best one. So yeah. it sort of just becomes like, yeah, I see why yours is cool. Do you want to try taking this chunk of your track list and using that and this chunk of my track list and using that? Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know, by the time, the track listing part of album making happens. We've heard all of these songs a billion times in a billion different forms. And I, I definitely start feeling like I have no idea what it would be like to hear them for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the trickiest part. That's, that's sort of how I tend to uh, approach track listing as like a first time listener. I think Chris maybe more uh, reasonably, I think tends to make his track list based on uh, like w- when, when someone's listening for the hundredth time, will they still mm-hmm. feel this flow works well? Um, I think, yeah, I, I tend to be a more emotional, uh, like <laughs> terrified track list maker. Okay. Yeah. And he and he is more and this sort of goes also with our like set lists live. I think I'm always like, okay, there are gonna be like probably 10 people in the room who might not have even want to come. Like maybe their friend made them come because they had an extra ticket. So how do I make that person as excited as possible? And Chris is always like, well, there are gonna be 10 people who have been to 20 We Are Scientist shows how do I make them the most interested mm-hmm. yeah. in the set? I don't know. It, it seems like a, a million different valid ways of approaching these processes. And I still don't know what the best approach is. It's because there yeah, isn't the best valid. approach. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so what song on the album took longest to write and which one is your personal favorite? Hmm. Well, I think... Um, bought myself a grave took longest to complete but I think that's because we 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 had that first half sort of that you know folksy country-ish acoustic ver- like first half we had that for a long time and we knew that wasn't enough for a song and we also knew we wanted it to go somewhere weird, but we didn't know where. And so it scared us. So we put it off for a very long time. Okay. Like I think, I think we, we recorded the first half 
really early on. And then we're like, uh, let's worry about this later. We have so we have like the vision for all these other songs ready to go right now. Mm-hmm. So let's work on those. Um, and I think, I think that's why that second half is as cool to me as it is, is because it was the only thing we were focusing on while we were working on that second half. Like, mm-hmm. I think everything else was done at that point. And we're like, okay, bought myself a grave. What is going to happen? Yeah. And, and so I think we, we kind of just went extra crazy on it because we had nothing else we needed to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so in many ways that, that is, that is definitely one of my favorite songs on the record. That second half is, is one of my favorite things we've ever done for sure. Oh. Um, for me, writing wise, I don't know. I'm not sure that I, the songs that I tend to like the most are the ones that the, the essence of the song happens the most quickly. Mm-hmm. Like if, if I have to labor over parts or like if I have a chorus and don't know what the verse is and then end up trying to like write a bunch of different verses that uh, there's, there's something about me that almost never feels like it uh, is organic after mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have, I have many like tiny chunks of songs that I love this like bit and I wish I could put it somewhere. Um, so yeah, usually, usually the songs that I like the most are the ones that, uh the the crux of the song exists you know it in its first writing session Mm -hmm. and i walk away with a thing where i'm like that song's that song's really awesome yeah how do i how do i make this song that exists better like rewrite lyrics and like add you know different parts or rewrite you know the guitar part or something like that but the I, i sort of need the melody and the verse chorus to exist for me to even like think of something as a song mm-hmm. that that I will that I will then beat into shape I almost never want to like reverse engineer the song itself yeah, yeah. that's fair uh, so can you tell us where headspace is at while you're writing this album um yeah I mean like I said be, be, because because these days we sort of try to make a point of not writing like an album anymore like we Mm -hmm. we we sort of finish working on an album and then you know from that day until the next time we're recording an album we're like now we're just writing a bunch of songs Mm -hmm. we'll see what the songs are when it's when it's time to record an album sometimes we see what the songs are and we're like oh we are not ready to record an album (laughs) yet yeah let's 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 push the let's push the date back um but yeah i mean the i so i think the headspace wall writing for for this album tended to just be uh you know kind of enjoying the songs a little more like when i'm not writing i tend to be very stressed out about when we will have an album written Mm -hmm. but but i try to like be good about not letting that guide my hand when I'm, when I'm writing songs, like when, when you're trying to like sit down and write a hit or whatever, I feel like you, I I end up overthinking it and like just throw and often like throwing away stuff that could end up being cool just because I don't see where it's going in that minute. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, like I think these days I try to end up at the end of a day with a song that I like rather than at the end of like three months with a song that I like, okay. yeah. if that makes any sense. I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so how do you recommend that your fans listen to the album for the first time? Should they do it in the car with friends in the dark with headphones on Is party album, workout album? What do you think? Um, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, I, I you know, I, that's, that's, I think that's too subjective a thing for me to say. I, I think it's a party album. Oh. I could see like mm-hmm. running 
to the album. I would, I, mm-hmm. If I ran, if I exercised at all, <laughs> I could imagine that being a useful, a useful soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think listening to it loudly is probably, probably a move. Maybe, maybe dancing to it is a, is a good idea. So this one should be super, super quick. Off the top of your head, I want you to describe this album for new listeners in three words. No more, no less. Oh, man. Um, I would say rambunctious. Mm-hmm. Um, hooky. And hooky? La- hooky. Hooky. Oh. Okay, H-O-O-K-Y. sorry. I thought you said cookie, and I was a little confused, but I was oh. with you. So, and, I'll yeah. say, and I'll say cookie. It's, okay. It's hot. It's hot, pretty sweet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's got it's got some crunch to it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Inter- I'll take but, that. But but the middle is a little gooey. Yeah. It's a little. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in that same train of thought, is there a certain feeling or emotion you want your listeners to have while going through the album? Um. Yeah. You know. We. So we recorded uh or i guess shot the video for the song contact high in miami Mm -hmm. and part of the video takes place on jet skis and insanely since i grew up in in south florida i had never been on a jet ski before chris had never been on a jet ski before and we both realized that jet skiing might be the best thing that people do Mm -hmm. like of all of all the enterprises in the human experience jet skiing might be the might be the best one yeah okay yeah yeah so uh i i I definitely started and i do and i think the the music is pretty good soundtracking to jet skiing because i think they shoot for the same uh the same the same essential emotion like Mm -hmm. exhilaration and kind of like joy but a little bit of fear like mm-hmm. a tinge just a tinge of terror that that makes terror. the pleasure all the all the sweeter okay <laughs> so, all right so, so that's a certain ski. feeling okay <laughs> yeah yeah terror, the feel you know. the feeling of being on a jet ski like really opening it up mm-hmm. but you're in you're in you're in like open water so there's not you know you're not going to crash into another sea craft yeah or anything like that okay Okay. all right right. interesting all right uh so what band or artist (laughs) influence do you hear the most on this record Mm. that's a very good question thank you um it's it's hard because i um like i think i think the more music we write the less obvious it is at least to me who our influences are Mm-hmm. like our very 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 first songs were were very indebted to like Weezer and kind of like Green Day and bands mm-hmm. like that yeah. and then our first record that we you know after we'd been living in New York for four years was very indebted to like Yeah Yeah Yeahs and like Interpol mm-hmm. and and now I have a hard time like hearing other people in our music. And I, I'm not saying that it, that influence is not there, but I think um, it's harder for me to spot that there are little moments here and there that like, I know there's, there's a little bit in a uh, handshake agreement that really reminds me of this band from like late 1990s, California called Creeper Lagoon that no nobody else has heard of yeah but they they were uh they were like a really big local band hmm. they, they were signed to a major label but nothing ever happened with them but they we moved to northern we moved to san francisco bay area right as they were like signed to a major label so everybody in town was like oh creeper lagoon they're about to blow up and they never blew up oh but <laughs> the the, the album the album they made right before they got signed to dreamworks is like an amazing version of like late 90s bedroom pop Hmm. where it's like you know computers were really slow and sucked at that point so it's a lot of like sample like they're using actual samplers and stuff Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's like a lot wonkier and weirder and trippier than a lot of bedroom pop now because it was hard for idiots to be precise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? um, but so there so there are moments there and there are moments in like our production that kind of remind me of that because I think we were like I said I think we were trying to avoid um, the way self producing bedroom rock uh, can often be too clinical and too precise Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you do it, you know, on a laptop. So I think we pointedly like tried to choose, uh, you know, takes with character or even like errors in them uh, just to like keep it a little weird and loosey goosey and stuff. So I definitely hear Creeper Lagoon in, in, in a lot of this record. Okay. All right. I feel like I have to ask, since you mentioned Weezer and Green Day, did you go to Hell Omega? No. Oh, Come man. on. Well, so it, it, we this is this is gonna sound even shittier oh, no. than that we simply didn't go. Mm-hmm. So our our booking agency, we, we share an agency with Fallout Boy. God damn. Oh. Okay. Nice. And so we we asked if we could go to mm-hmm. Hell Omega. And our agent was like, yeah, of course. The agency has like a big box at, I think it was at City Field here in New York. Where, oh, are, you, where are you guys? I'm in New Jersey. I went to the Philly in, date. And I'm in Virginia. Right. And they didn't okay. have any dates <laughs> in Virginia. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, but so our agent like g- g- gave us tickets to the show. And then on the day of, we were like, well, Chris, so Chris and I were big COVID fearers. Yeah. Early on. We definitely like stayed home mm-hmm. for a long time. Uh, and on the day of, we were like, well, do we really want to be like if, if, if we had gone and we were sitting in like the outside area mm-hmm. at City Field, I think we would have felt OK about that. But our tickets were in like a VIP enclosed zone mm-hmm. yeah. and we were like oh i feel kind of like creeped out by that like i think mm-hmm. i won't have fun mm-hmm. so on the day on the day of we decided not to go and i'm it, i'm i'm pretty mad i'm pretty like in re- like the day after i was like that was really stupid we should have gone whatever it's fine but i don't know for some reason that day we were both kind of like oh in my defense in my defense Okay. We, we had we had a show we had our very first show in like 18 months oh that that next friday mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we were like if we oh, got mm-hmm. sick if we got mm-hmm. sick because we went to the fucking weezer show <laughs> and we've, we've seen we've seen weezer like 15 times you know yeah. you're like if we if we if our show gets canceled because we watched weezer play a toto cover yeah. I'm gonna be pretty. I'm gonna be pretty mad. At you us. make it sound that, so that was, lame. That was why. I mean, that it, was that's why. That that's what why. it is. You, you yeah. may, I mean, Weezer's set like Weezer is just kind of lame. So like their set was okay. obviously well, very hey, lame. Hey, hey, I wouldn't hey, go that far. Hey, hey. Slow down. Hey. Their teal hey. album's pretty good. Yeah. The, you mean the cover album? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> exactly. All uh, their original music sucks. <laughs> Anyway, I, I would assume you're probably a Weezer fan. My bad. Obviously. Hope I'm not insulting, I'm not well, insulting look, you too so, bad. So look, I am a big Weezer fan. I their 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 latter day work is interesting to me. I I almost never listen to a new Weezer album and say these guys are nailing it. <laughs> but 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 I have to admit that often. Like years later, I'll hear a song that I previously had declared was another piece of shit. And I'll be like, there's kind of something about that song Mm -hmm. that like it it snuck in and makes I still feel bad about myself. But I'm like, that's a that's kind of a good song. (laughs) That's kind of a good song. There's there's a song from this last album. I can't think of I can't think of what it is. It got like radio play. Oh, um, that's end of pretty, the game. Good. End of the game. I don't know. 
No, it's the it's the one with the alien music video. That one bangs. I will give them that. That one was really good. I don't know. There, there is a song on that last record that, in retrospect, I'm kind of like, that's kind of a good song. Music. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When when Pork and Beans came out, I was like, what is wrong with these fucking guys? <laughs> and now, I, like, legitimately, Pork and Beans is one of my favorite songs. Mm-hmm. I, I love that song, song solely off of their live performance from Hell Omega because they had the pork and beans like logo up behind them. It was fucking great. I was like, this well, is the best thing that's, ever. That's a bad reason to like a song <laughs> except they had a pork and beans logo behind it. But hey, whatever works. Whatever exactly. works. Exactly. See, Weezer know what they're doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. apparently mm-hmm. so. Uh, so back to your album. Uh, what is your favorite memory that you made while creating this album? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, there was there were like a lot of cool. Vi- I mean, well, so w- one of my favorite parts of making this record was that we would we would do takes um, of our drummer Keith, sort of playing, you know, the song as straight as possible, mm-hmm. and then over the course of the day's recording, Chris and I would have more and more margaritas. And Keith would smoke more weed, mm-hmm. and we and by the end of it, we'd just be like, "Just play whatever, just play nothing but fills the entire song." And we'd do huh. like four takes where all he did was fills the entire time, and it made it made our job much, much, much more difficult as the editors and producers because yeah. then later on we'd have to go through hours and hours of stuff, but. Some of some of my most fun moments making this record were taking a fill he did in one spot and like putting it in an entirely different incorrect spot. Oh. And and it would make like a, a weird fill that no person would ever intend to do. Mm-hmm. But that's really awesome. And uh I think some of I think those are like some of my favorite moments making the record are like putting a fill or like even putting, you know, a keyboard part and like flipping it backwards and putting it in a spot and be like, well, that's weird. That makes me happy. Yeah. So I take it you'll be like producing your next record. We're definitely producing this next one that we're working on now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if we'll like always self-produce, but okay. we're, we're having fun doing it now. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so for this question, I want you to picture you're on tour. You're at a gas station for a rest stop. You're going in. What is your snack of choice? Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, probably like a, a popcorn situation. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. It sort of depends because packaged popcorn can either be amazing or it can be tasteless garbage Chewy. yeah 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 mm-hmm. um the weirdly europe does amazing packaged popcorn mm-hmm. and they do terrible movie theater popcorn oh whereas whereas the united states i think does the opposite yeah the united states makes unbeatable movie theater popcorn mm-hmm. but pretty pretty bad actually the united states bagged popcorn game has gotten a lot better in the past five years i would say it has yes um but boy oh boy nothing can beat a, a movie theater bag of popcorn in my in my book all right perfect good taste uh so where do you <laughs> see the band in the next five years probably at the movies eating a big bag of popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> there you go shooting for the stars <laughs> um i don't know i mean hopefully hopefully still you know kind of kind of doing this vibe like you know make Keep, keep on making albums that we're excited about and, mm-hmm. and touring as much as we possibly can on this. Oh. Right, Eating perfect. popcorn. Yeah. Of course. All the popcorn. Uh, so for these last couple of questions, we're actually going to shift away from music, if that's okay with you. Sure. Great. So we're going to go straight to death row. Boom. So if you're on death row, what would your last meal be with a drink? Oh, de- not death row records. No. Unfortunately not. Yeah. My last meal with a drink Mm -hmm. um this is definitely going to be the lamest answer 
you've ever had. No way. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm scouring my brain for another possible answer mm-hmm. and I'm not finding it. But my favorite food is legitimately salad. Oh, okay. 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 Salad's Just good. Like, fucking salad is so good. Mm-hmm. So, so here, so I'm going to, I'm going to say just to, just to make it m- more exciting, mm-hmm. I would order from this place, Calexico in Greenpoint, which is a mm-hmm. Mexican restaurant that mm-hmm. makes a killer salad called the, I think it's called the Union Street Salad. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's like greens and corn. Mm-hmm. cucumbers tomato i think it's maybe got black beans in it some goat cheese oh my god but then i'd also get a big plate of nachos from Calisco mm-hmm. as well okay okay and a pitcher of margarita okay. there you go also from Calexico. Right. perfect nice are you sponsored by Calexico? no but I, i'm gonna I, i'd like you to at them on this so they hear this mm-hmm. and they know actually Maybe I I don't I don't want to we get we do get hooked up a lot at Calexico. Okay. They're good. They're good people. They're good. They're good. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. You deserve that. Yeah. Um. So if you could live in one fictional world for a week, where would you live? A, a fictional world. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I'm I'm having a hard time even thinking of good fictional worlds. Now, when you say a fictional world, do you mean like an an utterly invented like dimension, like the Star Wars fictional universe? Yeah, like or Star Wars. Like, or do you mean like uh, you know Charles Dickens's London? <laughs> I mean, if you want to go to Charles Dickens' London, like go for I don't. it. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I don't. I don't. okay. Yeah. Um, Man, I don't know. I what, think you're overthinking what, uh, the question a little too much. I, mi- I might be. What? What are like? Where? Where? What fictional land would you choose to live in? A uh, tired wimpy kid. Peaky Blinders. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I see that. I see where this is going. Yeah. Um, maybe like, maybe on one of the islands from the Pirates of the Caribbean series. Okay. Oh, like okay. all the ca- all the characters suck in those movies, and pretty much all the all the life on the boat. I mean, I think I've only seen maybe the first and second one. Oh my god! But all the <laughs> all the life on the boats kind of seems to stink pretty badly. Yeah. But every time they go into port on those, I'm like, that's a good fucking scene they got mm-hmm. going in Saint so Bart. Like, yeah, super wherever. lively. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go there perfect i love that Uh, so i have the honor of asking the last question every single person we've spoken to has actually said it is the most important question okay what is your favorite color Mm, that is the most important question Mm -hmm. um growing up i definitively said that orange was my favorite color it's a good color um i think these days i I do think orange is still the most interesting color Mm -hmm. it's hard to make work in a lot of in a lot of circumstances yeah Mm -hmm. um so i'm gonna say maybe like hot pink is maybe my favorite color now all right yeah that's a good color uh like miami pink Mm -hmm. okay very good uh so as Gloria said that's all the questions you have to say is there anything that you would like to plug I like to plug our album Huffy. I guess I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that's probably the only thing I need to plug. All right, perfect. Uh, well, thank you for now. This has been Keith from We Are Scientists, and we have been the Good Noise Podcast.